We are going to be looking today at Psalm 2. Psalm 2. We're going to be continuing our series that we're calling The Way, where we're just really taking a number of weeks and meditating on Psalm 1 and 2. And so we've kind of been, we did a week on one, a week on two, another week on one, and now we're going to be doing another week on two, and I think we'll have one more teaching in a couple of weeks to uh, wrap it up. But today we're going to be looking at Psalm 2, and we're going to be looking at the way embracing God's rule. The way embracing God's rule. So hear now the word of the sovereign Lord. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and he terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. One of the things that you see when you study history is that people who rise to political authority, whether they be called kings or monarchs or emperors or presidents, they tend to make much of themselves. They tend to think a lot of their own power and authority and ability. As I was getting ready this week, I remembered seeing um, the statement of an ancient Assyrian king up in the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore that I had laughed out loud when I first read it because the guy's quite full of himself. And I'm going to be reading some of that quote in just a moment. But I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from ancient kings. Uh, and, and it's an, an ancient king named uh, Ahurnasipal II, which is a uh, Assyrian king. And he said this, I am king, I am lord, I am praiseworthy, I am important, I am magnificent, I am foremost, I am a hero, I am a warrior, I am a lion, and I am virile. That's, that's what he said about himself. Another uh, inscription from another ancient uh, Assyrian king says this, Asher Nasserpal, attentive prince, worshiper of the great gods, ferocious dragon, conqueror of cities and the entire highlands, king of lords, encircler of the obstinate. That was the phrase I loved at the Walters Argyle. He's the encircler of the obstinate, crowned with splendor, fearless in battle, merciless hero, Hero, he who stirs up strife, praiseworthy king, shepherd, protection of the four quarters, the king whose command disintegrates mountains and seas, the one who by his lordly conflict has brought under one authority ferocious and merciless kings from east to west. Who thinks these guys were suffering from low self-esteem? I mean, wow, talk about arrogant 
they, they proclaimed that they could do anything, they had done anything, and did you notice, I'm the, I'm the king of other lords. I have conquered all the other kings. I have brought unity. There used to be a lot of kingdoms, but I brought unity. And in fact, the Assyrian Empire, which ruled shortly after uh, da David had been king, was the largest empire the world had ever known to that point and would be the largest all the way until Babylon would rise several hundred years later. So a question comes to us. We hear this and we can laugh, but is Psalm 2 just kind of the Jewish version of the same thing? Is David just saying, hey, I'm the lion, I'm virile, I'm the one who can do all of this, or is there something else going on in Psalm 2? How do we understand it? Who really is the king? And then the key question for you and me is, how do I respond to the king? So let's dive into Psalm 2, which really, if you were going to entitle it, is not David reigns, but the Lord reigns. Notice in the psalm, there are actually four major parts, and we're going to kind of move through them all briefly and then look at how it applies to us. The four parts are, in verses 1 to 3, the kings of the earth are presented in their rebellion against God. They are rebelling against God. In the second part, verses 4 to 6, we see the Lord responding to these rebellious kings. In the third part, the Lord turns and he speaks to his anointed one or Messiah, king, son, and gives his promise and his decree to his king, and then finally, in verses 10 to 12, it concludes with advice to the kings. And as we're going to see, advice to you and to me for how we respond to God and his king. So that's the four parts, and it breaks down very easy. Verses 1 to 3, 4 to 6, 7 to 9, and 10 to 12. So let's dive in and take a look at it. The first thing is notice the rebellious kings of the earth. Now, if you remember, one of the things I've been telling us in this series is Psalm 1 and 2 were meant to be read together. And so if you do that and you read Psalm 1 and it comes to the end and it's very, very clear that God is saying, if you will walk with me, if you will be wise and not walk with the wicked and the foolish and the scoffers, but rather listen to my instruction, there is blessing unending for you. One would expect after that that the very next thing we would read about is people who would say, well, that sounds good to me. But in fact, we get the exact opposite. Rather than uh, embracing this, we find that they are actually plotting against blessing. That's what the kings are actually doing. And notice, it is a picture of rebellion. In verses 1 to 3, we read, the nations are conspiring, they are plotting, they are taking a stand against, they are gathering together for the purpose, it sounds almost like Babel again, they're gathering together but it's for the purpose of getting away from God, throwing off God's authority. They are going to break off the chains that they view that God has placed on them and they are going to throw off the fetters that they believe God has placed on them. Every one of these terms is just a different way. It's like taking a diamond as we're talking about meditating it. It's all of them are just different terms saying, do you see all the ways that people rebel against God? They conspire. They plot. They stand against. They gather together against. They break. They throw off. Every bit of it is rebellion. And in fact, as I've mentioned in recent weeks, if you read the Psalms together, and this is a little harder for us in English, but there's a reference back in all of this to Psalm 1. Because in Psalm 1, the blessed person is one who uses all of his mental energy. He's meditating and saying, this is God's instruction to me. Lord, how do I respond to your instruction to me? How do I walk with you? Whereas in Psalm 2, the people are using all their mental energy because that word plot is the word meditate. 
But they're not meditating how to receive God's instruction. They're meditating how to get out from under God's instruction. They're not meditating on how they can walk with God. They're meditating on how they can walk away from God. They're not meditating on how they can receive God's rule. They're meditating on how they can throw it off. Same word. And, and the psalmist wants us to see, see, there's this, there are these two ways. There, there's the way of those who are walking with God and the way of those who want to walk away from God as fast as they can. And in Psalm 2, the basic disposition of the people being described is that they view God and his king and his instruction as chains that have to be broken, as fetters that have to be thrown off. There's no blessing here. This is restricting. This is limiting. This is stopping me from being who I think I can be. So we have a stark picture and contrast with the person we were reading about in Psalm 1 with what we're now reading in Psalm 2. But notice that we get the Lord's response in verses 4 to 6. The Lord is shaken by all of this, and he goes out and he hires a PR firm to figure out how he can get in line with what all these people are saying. Is that what the Lord does? That's, that's the modern American translation of what God does. He's going to get in line with us. But see, notice what God actually says in verses 4 to 6. The one enthroned in heaven does what? He laughs. He says, y'all are being ridiculous. The Lord scoffs at them. God scoffs at the scoffers. In verse 5, he rebukes them in his anger, and he terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. See, God does not go out and get a PR firm. He's not sweating with whether they like the message or not. He's not changing his Torah, his instruction, because they don't like it. And in fact, when they tell God, you need to get with it, and you need to get on the right side of history. Who's heard the phrase, get on the right side of history? See, what God tells them is, I am history. It's just my action. I know the right side, and what I'm telling you is you need to get on the right side of history. I will not change who I am. I will not change what I have decided. I will not change my character, my nature, the way I act. I'm not changing. You're going to have to change. And so notice again, we're told that God rebukes them. He warns them. He commands them. Some of those are down in verses 10 to 12. All of this is that God is not shifting and changing. And that's why he concludes this section with saying, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. See, they're saying this is a chain, we got to break it. And God says, I'm strapping the chain down tighter. What you're viewing is a chain. They're saying, we don't want to be under the rule of this one. God says, he's in charge. It's a simple, basic dichotomy in life. And so God declares that his king, his Messiah son, is installed as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, let me just say, and we're going to come back to this in a future meditation, but this is meant to be great comfort to you and me. It is great comfort to God's people that we can live in light of the fact that the nations may rage, they may conspire, they may plot to overthrow God and his kingdom and establish their own rule. But whatever they do, God is sovereign. And God is accomplishing his will. And God is establishing his kingdom. See, the right side of history has already been declared. You can read, it's the good news, you can read to the end of the book. And you can see God wins. That's the only rule to this game. God is going to win. And that is meant to be comfort to you and me as we're trying to walk in the way of God's instruction. And we seem to be surrounded by many, many people declaring it's the wrong way. They don't want to hear that. It's hateful. You're a bigot and all this kind of stuff. We don't have to get worked up. We can just sit back and say, we already know how the game ends. God wins 
And yes, I am on the right side of history. Yes, I am walking in the way. And by the way, what you think are chains is actually freedom. That's what God's telling us to do. Now, then the Lord turns after he has rebuked these kings and said that I'm installing my king. What we're told is he turns to that anointed one, that Messiah, that king, that son, and he speaks to him in verses 7 to 9. And notice once again, God doesn't turn to Jesus because we know this is Jesus and say, I'm sorry, I know we had talked about this before we created anything, but they took a poll and they don't want you. And I mean, I've got to go with popular opinion. It's, it's democracy. That's the way the universe runs, right? See, God doesn't say that. God turns to his son and says that you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, I'll make the nations your inheritance. The ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. They're just like pottery, and you got the rod of iron. You can do with it as you will. You rule, and you reign. And this is, again, good news for us. You should cling to this and pray this verse regularly. God has promised he's going to reach the nations. You know why I have confidence to keep praying for what God is doing right here in Maryland? Because God has promised he's going to rule and reign over the nations. Why I have confidence to keep praying for India and Indonesia and Iran and the places that we are supporting missionaries and there is suffering going on is I know God will rule and reign. I have read in Revelation that people from every tribe and every language and every nation are going to be there on that day and they are going to be gathered in worship before the throne. God's promise to Jesus is being fulfilled and will be fulfilled. Let me speak to you just as a moment as an elder and a shepherd. There are too many Christians wringing their hands. I don't know what's going to happen exactly tomorrow in America. I can't tell you what's going to happen a year from now or two years from now. But I do know this. At the end, Jesus will rule and reign, supreme and sovereign over all. He will be worshipped by people from every group, every epoch, every area. He's going to be lifted up and receive the glory and the praise and the honor that he is due. And everyone who has been part of his people, who have followed him, whatever mocking, whatever scoffing, whatever suffering they have, have done in this age, they're going to receive back a thousandfold. That is what God has promised to you and me. So we need not fret. We need not worry. If we can look back at their threats and God's laughing, join him with the laughter. Just join him with the laughter. Now, this is God's promise. And so, in essence, don't miss it. The kings have said we're rebelling and God said, I overrule your rebellion. My son rules over you. You're not king of kings, Lord of lords. You're not encircler of the obstinate. You are the obstinate. And my son has encircled you. And then that leads us to the last section, which is advice for these rebellious kings. In verses 10 to 12, God uh, speaks to them and says, Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he become angry. And, and he'll continue on and I'll come back to those in a minute. But notice what God is telling them is, look, I know you were over in the corner and you were conspiring and you were whispering and you were plotting. See, I was there. I was listening to every word of it. You thought you were in the dark. It was broad daylight. I was reading your mail every day. I know everything you were thinking. And so what I'm telling you right now is there is no conspiracy. There is no plot. You're not getting away from it. You better sue for peace right now. That's what you had better do at this moment. You've declared independence from me and from my king and from my word, my instruction, but it's not a democracy. I get the only vote and I have overruled what you have said. I rule, my son rules on the throne, my word is true and rules over all. Here's the only question, will you submit? Do not be a fool, be wise, 
understand the warning and heed the warning. Embrace God's king uh, and his rule with willing submission and love. Notice it says in verse 12, kiss the son. This is not a, a grudging, well, I have no other choice. This is a willing embrace of God and his authority. You kiss the son. There is a willing submission. Notice it says uh, in verse 12 there, you are to, uh, in verse 11, you are to serve the Lord of fear and rejoice. This, there's, there's no anger here. Now there is a rejoicing at the throne of God and there is a loving back to God. That's God's call to them. Now let's ask ourselves the question, how does this apply to me? Well, the first question might be, does this text even address me? I mean, I could sit here and say, glad I'm not one of those kings. It's really good that, you know, they're in trouble. But see, this text, though it is speaking to the kings, and it certainly does include the kings of the nations, it also addresses you and me. And we know that for at least three reasons. Number one, the book of Psalms, of which this is part of the introduction, is addressed to everyday people. It's, it's not addressed to everybody out there. It's actually addressed to even those who are within God's covenant people, not just leaders. Secondly, Psalm 1 is clearly addressed to everyone. It's not just addressed to leaders. And Psalm 1 and 2 are meant to be read together. So there's the Psalm 1 speaking to us. Psalm 2 is speaking to us just from a different angle, just from a different way. And thirdly, if you've paid any attention at all in your interactions with human beings, this is an accurate description of what we're all like. This isn't just kings. This isn't just rulers. All human beings in their own heart have this same struggle. And that means I have to wrestle through the message of this psalm and how it addresses me, not someone else. Just a, a good little tip when you're reading the Bible, don't read the Bible for how God is rebuking others. Read for what God is speaking to you. See, and it's not even when I read those nasty Pharisees, how am I like a Pharisee? How is God addressing me as he's addressing the Pharisees? So that leads us to the question then, if that's what God is doing, here's the question that Psalm 2 poses. How do I respond to Christ's lordship of everything? See, the message of this psalm is he doesn't even just rule Israel. Jesus doesn't just rule the church. He rules everything, everywhere, everyone, at all times. How do I respond to that? See, the psalm is confronting human rebellion against God. And if we are honest, every one of us can recognize this, and it goes back to the previous series where we looked at Genesis 1 and 2. My sin nature views God and his rule and his word as binding. Be honest. When you're wanting to sin, when temptation is tugging at your soul, you're not looking at God's instruction and God's rule and saying, that looks like freedom. If we believe that, we would not do what? Sin. I wouldn't sin if I realized that this was real freedom and real blessing. I would not be viewing it the way it is. So we, like the people in Psalm 2, are tempted to expend great mental energy to explain away God's clear revelation to us so that we can indulge our own desires. We are all tempted to engage in this. And let me just go ahead and tell you, I've been a believer now since 1978, so for over 43 years, and I have an advanced degree in this stuff from seminary. All that does is make it easier for me to try and explain this stuff away. I can just tell you silly things like, well, if you really could read the Hebrew, you would understand it's saying it's okay for me to behave this way. Except for it's not. That's just foolishness. That's my sin nature speaking through. Now, I'm going to break it down into three different groups of people and show that all of us, whichever group we're in, 
We are all tempted to do this. First off, there are those who are just not religious. There are even people who declare they don't even believe God exists. There may be somebody here this morning or somebody who's listening later. And they say, you know what? I live the way I do because I don't even think God exists. I've looked around and I don't think there's evidence for God. They deny the clear, irrefutable evidence in creation, in themselves, and in the scripture that God exists, he is holy, he is powerful, and we are all going to stand in front of him one day. Now, if you've been around very long, you will hear people say, you know, if there was evidence, then maybe I would believe. But I've looked around, and I'm, I just, I'm sorry, I don't see the evidence. God says, liar! There's nothing but evidence. The reason you're not seeing the evidence is you're suppressing it. You're pushing it down. You don't want to see it, so you gouge your eyes out and then blame me for it being dark. That's what human beings have done. Not my word. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 20 says this, The wrath of God, remember in Psalm 2 it says, Lest the, the wrath of the Son can be poured out. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth in their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Now I want you to notice here, I mean, God's going out of his way to try and point out to us there is no excuse. He's using words saying we're suppressing the truth. What may be known about God is plain. It's not difficult. It's not over the corner. It's plain because God himself has made it plain. Because from the creation world, God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen, being understood, being known from what has been made so that we are without excuse. So I'm confronted with something. When somebody tells me, I would believe if I could see the evidence, I either believe them or I believe God. Because God says there's nothing but evidence. It's all around you. It's inside you. It's around you. And I wrote it down in a book so you couldn't miss it. It's right there. And if you're not getting it and you're not believing it, that is your own desire. They say they can't know if God exists. God says they can't not know that he exists and that they're going to stand in front of him. So see, when people are proclaiming, and they may be non-religious, and we're proclaiming that I'm free and I'm answerable to no one, God, just like in Psalm 2, stands up and says, that's not the way it is. And you know it's not that way. And I'm warning you, wake up now before it's too late. But there are other people, and we can call them, you know, particularly here in America, we can call them religious progressives. Okay, they'll say, well, there is a God and, and he has been real and they might even talk about Jesus, but they spend all of their time and energy. They are plotting how they can remake God in their own image. So they will admit that God has even revealed himself in scripture, but they reject that clear revelation because they want to redefine the nature of God, what is good and what is evil, the essential teachings of the faith that have been given once for all to the saints. Now, we may be tempted to think, you know, wow, it's so terrible that this is happening today. Friends, this has been happening right from the beginning. This has always been there. In the book of Jude in the New Testament, Jude wrote this. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So you've been given the faith, this content of who God is and what good and evil is and how one knows God and how we walk with God. You've been given all of this. But here's the problem. Certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men 
who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Now see, these people, unlike the first group, they proclaim they believe in God. They proclaim they, they are part of the faith. But Jude tells us they're not part of the faith. They are actually denying God. They are denying Jesus Christ. Our, and notice here the issue, our sovereign and Lord. They are denying the authority of Jesus Christ. And in particular, it tells us that they're doing this so that they can live immoral lives. The particular thing that they always inevitably want to do is deny God's authority so they can choose to live how they want. They change the gospel into a license for sin, and Jude tells us when you do that, you've actually denied Jesus Christ. You can proclaim whatever you want, but you are actually denying Jesus Christ. Now, if you pay any attention at all and you talk around, you're going to hear this and run into it because it's everywhere. My news feed is littered up with this stuff, with people doing this, even people who claim to be evangelicals and Bible-believing. Let me say this as clearly as I can. This is not a different form of Christianity. It is a completely different religion. It has nothing to do with Christianity. It has nothing to do with the gospel that has been given once and for all to the people of God. And notice here, Jude tells us it's abominable to Jesus Christ. And if you may remember, Jesus said on that day, there will be those who will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things? And I'm going to tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Away from me. See, what they want is, we want a little Jesus. We, we want to hear that Jesus is loving. I don't want to hear he's holy. I want to hear that he's Savior. I don't want to hear he's Lord. But it's a package deal. You don't get one or the other. You get who Jesus is. And these voices are all around us. So it doesn't matter what label somebody wants to use. What matters is the content of what they are saying. Am I under the authority of God, his king, his word, or am I under my own authority? The third group are religious conservatives. They're not progressives. They're conservatives. They say, oh, no, I, I profess the faith. I embrace the Bible as God's word. But in reality, we can tend to deny Jesus' lordship in every area of life. One particular temptation, if you look in the New Testament, this is a group known as the Pharisees. Look, you didn't have to convince the Pharisees. If you say the Torah from Psalm 1, they're like, oh, love the Torah. Meditate on it day and night. The problem is they're completely disobeying it and they refuse to understand what God is actually saying. Jesus speaks to this group in Matthew 23. This is right as he pronounces a final shattering of everything that has gone on with the nation of Israel. And he's, he's leaving the temple desolate to them. In Matthew 23, he pronounces seven woes on the leaders of Israel. And in Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24, he says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law, you who take the Torah and you're teaching it, you're studying it, you're putting it out there, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, which, by the way, if you go back and read the law, they didn't have to tithe on those. They proclaimed they were holier than God. They were wiser than God. God said, look, that stuff's so small, don't worry about it. Oh, no, 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 we're, we're going to worry about it because we're going to prove our own righteousness. And Jesus continues and says, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, and you swallow a camel. I mean, what a great word picture Jesus gives us. A little gnat, you got that out and somehow the camel slipped through. See, and Jesus says, you're blind. See, and what they do, notice he had said at the beginning of the woes, 
Jesus had said that the problem was not just that they stressed God's holiness without a stress on love is the exact opposite of the other group, but Jesus says, you're not actually doing what you're proclaiming. You're proclaiming yourself to be something just like the kings that were off in the corner plotting. I know who you really are. So in Matthew 23, 3, at the very beginning of the woes, Jesus said this, speaking to the people. He said, look, you've got these religious authorities. They sit in Moses' seat. But in verse 3, he says, do not do what they do, for they don't practice what they preach. We've all heard that, right? Don't practice what you preach where it came from. It's the lips of Jesus. Jesus warned us about that. Many things the Pharisees said were true. They were right. But the problem was they did not practice them. They railed against behaviors that others were practicing, and in secret, they were doing the exact same thing. Now, the good news is that never happens in the Christian church today. How sad is it that we constantly, I, I open and I scroll through my news feed and leader after leader after leader falls. And, and I watch Christians who will excoriate the behavior, repudiate the behavior when it's being done by somebody they don't like or agree with, and then suddenly they get silent or defend it when it's their own guy. But see, Jesus says that's hypocrisy. It's not the way we're to be. And ultimately, it's a rejection of Jesus' lordship is what it amounts to. And modern evangelicalism, please hear me, has failed in this area miserably. And we have undermined the, the faith we claim to love. I just saw this past week a new report that came out. I, I won't mention the name, but a person who preaches truth, but a number of years ago was uncovered for being a terribly abusive leader. Staff meetings on Monday morning were filled with him raging against the staff dropping F-bombs, and I'm not exaggerating, dropping F-bombs on the staff for what didn't go right in the Sunday morning meeting, not being under anybody's authority. When they tried to bring him under authority, the person bolted, went to another city where he has 2,000 people gathering around him this Sunday. And here's the shock. He's still behaving the same way. And evangelicals let him get away with it because he's a religious conservative. But at the end of the day, friend, that is still a rejection of the lordship of Jesus Christ. Let me, I wasn't even gonna bring this up or say this, but, but I'll speak it on behalf of all the elders. We are here and we are glad to serve as under shepherds and to labor, but your ultimate authority is not me, it's not the other elders, it is Jesus Christ. And we stand before him. And woe unto us if we ever forget. Every time I see these guys getting in trouble, nobody was there to hold them accountable. They were living like the rules didn't apply to them. Psalm 2 reminds me the rules always apply. There is one king. There is one shepherd. And we all answer to him. Beware anybody who doesn't live and preach that. Paul said we don't... We don't preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. That's the message of the gospel. So, as we get ready to come to the Lord's table, let me ask you the question. I've listed these different groups, and maybe there's even a different way. Is the Holy Spirit convicting you in one of these areas? Is there an area where the Spirit is showing me I have compromised so that I can walk the way of the world? or because somebody I love is walking in that way. So that's a whole other thing we can do. I can be against something until somebody I love and care for suddenly they're in it, and now I start changing what I believed and what I proclaimed before, because well, I really love and care for this person, but see, truth doesn't change. Is the Holy Spirit bringing some area like that to my mind? Is the Spirit bringing to my mind an area I've rejected of the Lordship of Christ? Where 
Honestly, I might not say this in public, but this feels like a chain. This feels like repression. Surely God wouldn't want this way. I'm so tired of reading even evangelicals reasoning from the way I think and I feel and saying God must think and feel the same way. When God has already told us in his word, your ways are not my ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. I'm, I'm, I'm different than you are. Don't reason that way. I'll tell you who I am, believe it. I'll tell you what the truth is, believe it and embrace it. I'll tell you the way, walk in it. Don't decide what you think and then decide that that's the way I am. Is the Spirit bringing something like that to my mind? Now, the good news that I want to end with is as he does that, remember the psalm tells us what to do at the end. It doesn't leave us. It's not just law. There is gospel. It ends with the good news that God offers forgiveness and refuge for those who turn to him. Every one of us have failed. Every one of us have broken God's law. But forgiveness is offered to us if we repent of our rebellion. Pretty much here's the one unforgivable sin. People like to try and figure out refusing to repent, refusing to acknowledge God's lordship, refusing to come clean and say, I'm a sinner and I deserve wrath, but I've been given mercy. So do we do that this morning? I want to urge and encourage you this morning as we get ready to come to the Lord's table to come, to openly confess sin. And as we come to this table this morning to use this as the opportunity to say, Jesus, I kiss the Son. I find my refuge in you. I embrace you. I've been meditating on your Torah. I've seen both your righteousness and my sin, and I've seen your call for me to find refuge in you. And so, oh Lord, I come. If you can go ahead and take your packets out, we're going to get ready and come to the table. I want to remind you, as I proclaim this, the Lord's table is the Lord's table. It's not the table of Bay Ridge. So you don't have to be a member of our congregation. You do have to be a member of Christ's church. You do have to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You do have to say, I don't want to be one of the rebellious kings. I actually want to be one of those who kiss the son and find refuge in him. If you're not that, the table's not for you because the table is a proclamation, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. I understand that. I believe that. I embrace that. Spirit of God, help me to live in that. If you believe that and you pray that, then you are welcome to the table with us. So you'll be able to take off the, the little first thing in just a moment as we come to the table. For what I receive from the Lord, I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, you are the sovereign one. As you are exalted to the right hand of the Father, you have poured out the Holy Spirit. So send your spirit now as we partake of this covenant meal. Meet with us that we might feast upon you fresh and new. We ask it in your name. Amen. Friends, take the bread. Lord Jesus, this bread is a reminder that because of our rebellion, because it's not just a few ancient Eastern kings, it's every one of us. We broke the covenant. We viewed your way of blessing as a path of burden. We viewed what was actually freedom as chains and fetters, and we broke your covenant 
again and again and again. And you had every right as the sovereign king to simply banish or execute us for our rebellion. And yet, O oh our Lord, you took flesh and you came down among us as a king not to crush and kill, but to serve and to be broken for us. And Lord God, we stand before you and say, O oh Lord, who but God would do this for us? And so we take this bread, and as we take it, we kiss the Son. We find refuge in Him, and we proclaim to serve you is true freedom. Brothers and sisters, take and eat. Lord, we hold up this cup of the covenant. From the beginning of time, Lord, you have been a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. And we freely confess our sins this morning. We are not covenant keepers, promise keepers. Lord, we are oath breakers. But by the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been brought into your people. And we rejoice this morning knowing that our covenant with you is secure because it is founded on better promises than the old covenant because it is secured not by the blood of bulls and goats, which could never take away sin, but by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, whose blood has cleansed us from sins past, present, and future, whose covenant provisions not only free us from the penalty of our sins, but are even breaking its power in our lives today. And so, Lord, we lift up the cup and we say thanks be to God for the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, take and drink. Let's stand together and I encourage you with me to cry out to the Holy Spirit to speak to us and to empower us this week. We don't want to be the rebellious kings, we want to be those who are finding refuge day by day and, and thereby walking in blessing. Holy Spirit of the living God, I pray that you would fall fresh on us. Lord, next week we'll be celebrating Pentecost, but we recognize, Lord, that you have come to dwell in each and every one of us as the people of God through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Spirit of God, that you would be stirred up within us I pray this week that when we are prompted to view God and his rule and his word as some kind of a chain, that you would remind us it is freedom. And that, Lord, you would stir up within us the wisdom and the, the power to embrace and say, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I am free at last. Lord, would you do this work in us by your Holy Spirit? And Lord, I pray that you would empower us this week as we work among people, as we live next to people, as we are in contact with people whose worldview is all upside down, who view freedom as a chain, who view your love as some kind of binding hatred. Lord God, I pray that you would empower us, that you would give wisdom to our tongues, that we could speak the gospel of grace to them. And Spirit of God, go before us. We pray that those who are in darkness would see the light, that those who have been blinded would have their eyes open. Lord, we confess, we too had gouged out our eyes. We didn't want to see, but by your mercy, we are here today as your people. Lord, enable us, empower us, work through us to be your witnesses from right here, Lord God, to the ends of the earth. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King, our Savior. And God's people say, Amen. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, 
be honor and glory forever and ever. And may his covenant blessings fill your life to overflowing. Go forth. You are blessed. Be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.